Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Did I scare you coming out of the pulpit? You get, you're used to that by now, aren't you, right? New pastor, it may come as no surprise to you, but Pastor Rhodes and I had the same preaching professor. And Pastor uh, Dr. Harms was convinced of two things. First, that the first century was steeped in rhetoric, in persuasive speech. And that no evangelist or squat would ever have survived in that environment unless they knew how to speak the gospel in a compelling way. And he used to say, can you imagine Paul on the steps of the Parthenon getting out his briefcase, pulling out his manuscript, and reading his dissertation to the gathered community of Stoics? Probably not. Secondly, he was convinced that faith comes by hearing and that proclamation was a joy and a gift to be shared. And that the preacher must embody the sermon. You must be the message of the gospel. It's not just words. It is your whole self that you are ultimately giving to it. And so the preacher is tempted then to come down into the congregation because, yes, Christ is enthroned on high on the right hand of God, but the Word also became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, I want to say welcome, first of all. Welcome and congratulations on your new call, Richard. How do you like our winters so far? <laughs> How good, Lord, to be here. <laughs> and I want to say congratulations to the congregation at first, too, in, in having a new pastor. And I want to say thank you to all of you that have come from far and wide congregations in the area to support first and to support Richard as they embark on this next chapter of First's life here on the island. It is so important. You are a living witness to the fact that we are church together. And being church together is inherently better than being church alone, as Jesus demonstrated in sending the 70 out in twos. That we need each other. Because it is together that we plant congregations. It is together that we send out missionaries. It is together that we send out campus pastors. It is together that we battle hunger and poverty. We do together what we cannot do alone. And I want to thank you for the scripture passages that you chose as well, too. Because they speak to this business of church being together. They speak of calling. They speak of a God who calls us and a God who sends us. So in our first reading from Isaiah, God tells Isaiah, I have called you. And I have taken you by the hand. That's an embodiment of the calling, is it not? And I will protect you. And I will send you out to be a mediator and a light to the nations. I think those are interesting words. A mediator and a light to the nations. And as I was reading this passage and studying it this week, I was thinking to myself, I'm pretty sure that we are all called. Yes, Richard, you are called to a ministry of word and sacrament in this place. You are called to proclaim the gospel and administer the sacraments. But by virtue of our baptism, we are all called to be evangelists of the gospel out into the world. We are all called to be mediators and a light to the nations. 
And I'm also pretty sure that that is not something we can do here in the building. It's very hard to be a mediator and a light to the nations in here, in our bushel basket. We can come here, we can be fed with word and sacrament, and we can be taught, and we can be trained, and we can support one another, but it is out there that the ministry of the gospel comes alive and happens, or not. And in Romans 10, the Apostle Paul in this section in which he's agonizing himself over his own Jewish community and whether or not they will see Christ as their Messiah, makes an interesting statement, the same statement that Peter interestingly makes in, the, in his Pentecostal sermon. He says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who will be saved? All. All who call upon the name of the Lord. How many? All. Even Muslims? Muslims who call upon the name of the Lord? Atheists who call upon the name of the Lord? Hindus who call? Even Lutherans who call on the name of the Lord? I like to joke when we are in ecumenical communities like we had recently with the week of prayer for Christian unity that we Lutherans know that we are not going to be the only ones in heaven, that others will be saved too. But why would you want to take a chance? <laughs> Think about it. It'll come. <laughs> the Apostle Paul pre preaches a very broad gospel that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But here's the rub. How can they call upon one of whom they have never heard? <laughs> And thus is his call to evangelism. For faith comes by hearing. And this is how this works in the Christian community. That Richard brings that word and proclaims it to you. And then you take that word and proclaim it to the world. Because you are the missionaries that are called to go out and preach the good news. And so finally we get to Luke chapter 10. The calling of the sending of the 70. And I love this because we have a God who not only calls, but doesn't call us just to be here, who sends us as well to He sends 35 teams. And in his pre-game locker speech, he says to them, by the way, I'm sending you out like sheep amidst wolves. Not a very inspiring speech, in my opinion. <laughs> But he's warning them, it won't necessarily be easy. It won't necessarily be easy for us either. Sometimes I think we're under the impression that when God says that we will be protected and I take you by the hand, that that means that there will never be rocky roads. That just because there's good news at the end of the road doesn't mean that there might not be challenges. In fact, he warns us, they will drag you before councils and it's going to be difficult along the way. I think it's also interesting in his speech that he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I think that's still true today. I think people are as spiritually hungry today as they have ever been in the history of the world. That we are a people that long for meaning. We, this is why we love stories so much. Where did everybody go? Is it something I said? <laughs> What, what, what is the me? We want stories. This is why we watch television so much and we love movies and we read books. We are, we are hungry for stories to help us make sense out of this life, to, to give structure and purpose. We want life to be more than just an endless task list or making more money so that we can have enough food to eat, so that we can have enough energy to go out and make more money so that we can have enough food to eat. There must be more to it than that. People are looking for something spiritual. They are looking for love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and all those fruits of the Spirit. And the church is uniquely poised to deliver the very thing that people are desperately hungry for. That hunger that they've been using mindless entertainment to try and fill in some ways, or maybe busyness at work or a host of other things. 
And so he sends these disciples out in pairs because ministry should never be done alone. I, I, I visited with a pastor who was retiring once and I said, if you could do anything over again, if you, if you could do your whole ministry over again, what's one thing you would do differently? And he said, I wouldn't have done all those homebound calls all by myself because it was lonely and I was never bringing someone along with me like Jesus taught. I was never training the congregation to do ministry. And after he said that, I went back and I started taking people with me on every hospital call, every homebound call. And so what happened was we were training the congregation to do the work of ministry, to be the body of Christ together as a whole. And an amazing thing happened. I would just go and take communion, but they would bring a peach pie. I would leave and they would stay and clean out the family's gutters. They would remember their birthdays, send birthday cards, have little parties. And I remember at Irene's funeral, that family were even asked to be pallbearers. Ministry happened in ways because I wasn't trying to do it all by myself. I think that if you try to do it all by yourself, it is a denial of Paul's theology of the body of Christ. And I think that if we as the body of Christ allow our pastors to do stuff that we ourselves could be doing, we ourselves have missed the theology of the body of Christ. Jesus sends the disciples out in twos. What does he send them out to do? Isaiah says to give sight to the blind and release to the captives. That's all. Jesus says to announce a word of peace and to heal the sick. That's all. But the promise is that I will be with you. And the fascinating thing is that when they come back, it says the disciples returned with joy. Even the spirits submit to us. That they saw things happening. They saw lives being impacted, lives being changed. Hope. There's nothing more powerful in ministry than when you see someone who is in despair comes to a place of hope. Somebody who has been lonely who comes into community and finds peace and joy in the life of the community. There's something exciting that happens when the church is the body of Christ together. Jesus' sending of the disciples is an invitation to us also to be sent out into the world in pairs. So I invite you to think, what's, what's your ministry? What are the unique gifts that God has given you? What are the things, I heard uh, Rob Bell this week put it this way, what is the thing in your life that won't go away? <laughs> the fire that burns in your bones that the Spirit has placed there, that may very well be your calling. It may be God talking to you like God talked to Isaiah, like God talked to Jesus, and like God talked to Richard, and how God talks to us. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I thank you for your ministry here in the community, and I pray that God will continue to inspire you and fill you with joy as you are invited to be sent out in ministry. Amen.